got some praise. We got quiet quick. Amen. Aren't you thankful? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Thank you for being a part of our service this morning. We're excited that you're here today. It's the week after Easter, and uh, we're just excited that you came back. Praise the Lord. You can laugh. It's okay. Give God some praise. Make some noise. 
Amen. If you're a first-time guest, we just welcome you. We do want to welcome you with a hand clap. Thank you for being a part of our service today. We're glad that you're here. If you did not receive a guest card, there should be one in the seat in front of you. If you'll just take that card, and at the end of service, there's welcome stations in either corner of the sanctuary. There's also one in the second foyer as you're leaving. Um, if you're in the balcony, it's in the foyer as you come out. If you'll just turn that card in, we want to give you a gift, and thank you for being a part of our service this morning. We're excited that you're here today. We know you could have been anywhere, and God brought you here. And so I believe there's a word for you, and uh, we're just excited to be a part of your day today. We want to remind you that at the end of the second service, we will be having a baptizing. If you want to go get some lunch and come back and be a part of that, that would be amazing. You know, the Bible talks about water immersion baptism in which a believer makes a public confession of their faith. So it's just letting people know on the outside what's happened on the inside. And John the Baptist spoke of this as being symbolic of turning from sin and being raised to new life. And so join us today. If you want to come back, we would love to have you to celebrate those who are making this um, profession of their faith today, this outward expression of what God has done on the inside. We're excited for them, and I know they're excited as well. So if you have a chance about 1230, come on back. We want to have you in the house and just celebrate those people this afternoon. We're excited about that. We're going to take up our tithes and offerings at this time, and if you are prepared to give today, we'll take this time to give you an opportunity to give. Deuteronomy 6. 16 and 17 says this. It says, each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. And if he has blessed you this week and you have brought a gift to give, we accept that gift this morning and just thank you for it. If you'll stand on your feet, there's different ways that you can give today. You can go online and give as well as you can give as the ushers come back past you this morning. So we're just again thankful that you're here. Um, just allow the Lord to, to just minister to you today for the next little bit. Put everything aside that's on your mind on your heart, all the things. We, we all have things on our minds, and sometimes we just have to come in and just put them aside and say, Lord, I'm going to take this time to focus on you because you're here for him today, and we're all here to celebrate him and to worship him. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we are honored and we are humbled to be in your service this morning. God, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you, God, for each and every person that has darkened the doors of this building. We just ask, Lord God, that you would minister to each and every person today, God, the way that they need to be ministered ministered to. God, in their bodies, in their spirits, God, maybe peace in their mind, Lord Jesus, but salvation in their heart. God, we just pray if there's someone here that does not have a personal relationship with you, that today will be the day when they come to know you in a way like never before. God, I just thank you for this service. I ask you to take this offering, God, as people are bringing their offerings this morning. God, maybe they're giving online. Lord, we thank you for that, God. We give you praise for that. We ask you to anoint and bless, God, each and every penny that comes into this ministry, Heavenly Father. Multiply it and use it as you would see fit, Heavenly Father. Bless the gift as well as the giver. We'll be careful to give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
God, we believe for it. From the impossible, we'll see a miracle. God, we believe. God, we believe for it. God, we believe. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God is awesome, isn't he? You can be seated this morning. Thank you so much for being here. I know my bride has already welcomed you today, and I'm believing that God has already had a word for you this morning. I think there's moments like this that you just, if when you begin to study his word or know his word or whatever it is, memorize his word, when we begin to repeat his word, recite his word, we can say we believe it, right? He said it, so I can believe it. And we begin to declare things for our family, declare things for our lives. And there's moments that when, when and in heartbreak, there's moments in loss that we just need the Word of God. And not only need the Word of God, we stand on the Word of God and say, you said it, and I'm going to believe it, and I need it, amen? And that song right there just speaks volumes. If you, uh, if you ever get a moment or get a chance to uh, pull that up and listen to the testimony behind that song... Uh, and I may share it with you in a minute, who knows, but it's just a beautiful testimony uh, that CC's brother, okay, I'm sharing it, wow, right, so CC's brother was really sick, uh, the doctors came into the waiting room where her and her parents were sitting, and they said, we're, we're sorry, we've done all we can do, and we apologize, and they were shaking their hands and doing the thing, and they just said, listen, we're believers, we're believers, but I've done all, I would you go try one more time? And before you go, we're going to pray for you, we're going to pray over him, and we're going to believe for it. And that's where the song came from. He came back out in about 10 minutes and said, I don't know what's going on, but you can go see him now. Such an awesome testimony. And man, to write a song on the, on the, on the back of that, to write a song on the end of that, how beautiful is it? That if you really understood where that song, the passion behind that song, the, I don't know, the faith behind that song, that that is an awesome moment that, man, just because they believed for it, right? God did a great work, a great testimony. Had he not moved in that moment, that song would have never been written. There wouldn't be people now that gave their heart to the Lord in that song, gave their, gave their junk to Jesus in that song, gave their family, their marriage, their brokenness over to Jesus in, during that song. And, man, I don't know. I just love, I love that song. It's probably one of my favorite songs at the moment, at least. And uh, I know God can do it, and so we just have to believe for it. Time and time again in Scripture, he says, if you'll only believe, right? If you'll believe. And then he'll say, your faith has made you whole. And so it came from our belief. It came from our faith. Our faith came from the Word, right? Without the Word, we can't have faith. You have to know, for me to have an experience or to walk in the goodness or the miracles of God, I have to know what he can do. Amen? I, David never one time asked how much, how much uh, weight Goliath could bench, right? How, how heavy a, a weight is he squatting? I mean, how, many, how far can he run without... What, what's his 40 look like? What's his 100 yard look? What is, he never asked one time about Goliath. Why? Because he knew about God. He knew the power and the presence, the strength of God. And so that's where we have to get to sometimes. When the, when the brokenness is bigger than us, right, we need someone else bigger than us. And so if you give God another hand clap of praise, I love that song. I hope I didn't take much of your time in that. Uh, but we welcome our, would you welcome our online family as well this morning? We are so grateful. <clears throat> we are working on our system. We're very excited. Our system is working uh, that we can share the praise and worship as well online. And so, man, that is going to be huge. Uh, so that when I get up here right after a song and I say something about the song, they'll actually know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, and so we just welcome you this morning. Uh, we're just going to be talking a little bit about, about life. Basically, I almost tailgating on that, at that song that we just sung because most of us are just busy. Are we busy? We, we're running to and fro. We're dealing with stuff day in and day out. Monday may be okay. I had a great Sunday. Monday may, may be okay, but Tuesday, whew, it went south real quick. 
Maybe Wednesday was all right, or maybe Wednesday was terrible, but you came to the house of the Lord, you got a word from God, and man, it seemed like Thursday was right on it, but this weekend has been something else. And so we hear all the stories, and if you haven't told us all your stories, I promise you've told somebody your story. You told someone what kind of day you've had. You told someone how tough it was. You told someone that you've been overwhelmed by all the things in your life and all the stuff that's going on in your life, and possibly you've not only been overwhelmed, but maybe you've been underwhelmed. By yourself, right? You knew better, right? I, I, I should have never gone there. I should have never done that. I should have never, I should have never said that. I, I, I'm overwhelmed by so much stuff that it caused me to be underwhelmed in me. I'm not near what I thought I was or who I thought I was. I can remember about, I don't know how long it's been now, 15 years ago or so. My bride can correct me on that. Uh, but about 15 years ago, I, for whatever, whatever was happening, the enemy was unleashed on me. Uh, I dealt with anxiety like I had never seen anybody else deal with it. Not that they hadn't, I just hadn't seen it. Uh, I dealt with flight or fight. I dealt with all the crazy things that you go through there. And respectfully, that's not meaning you're crazy. That just means crazy things we deal with. And so while I was walking through that, I had to have the word. While I was walking through that, I had to, I had to realize that, that, you know what, it wasn't about me. I can remember, remember praying this prayer in, in one of my moments, and I can remember saying out loud, and my bride, of course, heard me, but I can remember saying out loud, I thought I was stronger than this. So then I was not only overwhelmed with all of everything else, I was underwhelmed with me. That I realized all of a sudden I'm less than I thought I was, but here's the beauty of that. That's when I realized he was what I needed. It wasn't about me being stronger than this. Because Scripture says that when I am weak, right, then I am strong. And so when we submit ourselves, when we submit our stuff, our thinking, right, our mindset, our anxiety, our depression, our despair, whatever that looks like, when we surrender that, then in our weakness we become strong. When we surrender that to God. And so for someone that's walked it out, I, I know exactly what being overwhelmed looks like. I also know what being underwhelmed with myself looks like. That all of a sudden I had a reality that maybe, hey big boy, listen, you may pray and you may preach and you may sing and you may do all the things, but you not all that. It was a great reminder for me, by the way. It'll keep you humble, right? It'll keep you humble whether you're preaching to ten or a thousand. It'll keep you humble that you have an understanding of this really, this right here, really, this written about me. And so as I walked that out, man, God was so faithful and it goes along with the title of my message today. He was there. He was there. He was there in my moments. He was there when I was experiencing flight or fight. He was there when I was uh, running out my door into the yard at 3 o'clock in the morning out of panic and my bride right behind me quoting scripture or reading scripture. What broke that? The word broke that. The power of the word broke that. My faithful wife chasing me down in moments when I didn't know what to do, reading the word of God did that. And I realized that through all those dark moments and all those hard times and all those things, and by the way, listen, this isn't a pity moment. Don't, don't feel sorry for me, man. God, I, I, God gave me nuggets out of that. God gave me gold nuggets out of that. Nuggets that I'm going to cherish, and here's the thing, I get to share with you and still, look, this is, the only, this is the only riches that I can share and still have all of it. The, the wealth of my testimony, the wealth of my witness the wealth of the power of God that I can share with you with everybody or anybody and guess what I still have it isn't that yeah I've tried that cake and eating it too business I don't work but sharing what God has done for you that works you share that you distribute that you become the conduit of his grace of his love of his power uh, uh, of the breakthrough you you become the conduit of everything that God has done for you and you still get to keep it and wear it and share it and not, man, that's beautiful. I may have to write a book. That really was good. Y'all know how y'all, you know how I know that wasn't me? Because it was good. And so let's get, I, I love this portion of scripture that God is just so faithful. We're, I'm going to talk to you today about the uh, road to Emmaus. We've just come out of Easter. I, I know a lot of your friends were here. Some of your family were here, was here. And I know that it was a great day last week. There were people here that hadn't been in church in however long or had been in church but hadn't participated or whatever. Got to chat with some folks that said they hadn't gone to church in however long, but man, this was just a day for them and they would see us this Sunday. And so I'm excited about that. 
And it wasn't because, uh, because uh, everything, all the songs were just right. It wasn't because the skit was perfect. It wasn't because the word came forth perfect, but it was because of God. It, it was because he was there. He was here. And, and so when I look at that, I, I, do, my, I do my best, and I, whatever that looks like, my best is usually not good enough. Uh, but I find myself depending on him more and more as, as the church grows or as the ministry grows or as the call gets different. And uh, this road to Emmaus is probably one of my, again, favorite stories. It's, it is this week anyway. It's one of my favorite stories because we've walked right out of Easter and we, we're going to find ourselves walking down the, the road to Emmaus. Uh, and I hope that you can grab that this morning, even without illustration. And it says, now behold, two of them, talking about two disciples, were traveling that same day to the village called Emmaus which was seven miles from Jerusalem. You and I wouldn't walk seven miles if they paid us. Okay, let me, I threw y'all under the bus there. I wouldn't walk seven. I'm calling one of you guys, ladies and guys. Some of y'all come pick me up. I'm just saying. So I wouldn't walk seven miles necessarily, but here we are. And, and they talked together of, of all the things that, which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Isn't that just like Jesus? Verse 16. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and you are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas said, uh, answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have you... Uh, not known the things which happened in these days? Isn't that something? You see, I'd love to stop right there and we could talk about it, right? We'd talk about him being the only one that don't know what's happening. And I can tell you real quick, he's the only one that truly knew what was happening. And so that another, that's another day. And he said to them, and he said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and mighty in word before God and before all the people, and how the chief priests and, and our rulers delivered him and condemned him to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he was who we thought he was. I think that we could pause there. How many messages are in this portion of Scripture? We could pause right there that we would hope that he would be one thing, and it turns out he's completely something else. We would hope that he would answer one way, but he answers a whole other way, and it just kind of throws us into a frenzy. And I'm, I'm trusting again as I'm walking down to Emmaus that we were hoping that he was the one who would redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women in our company who arrived to the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had uh, seen a vision of angels who had said he was alive. But we're still talking. We still have our head bowed low. We're still sad. We're having conversations that we're not letting anybody else in on, right? We've sort of isolated ourselves because of the experience that we've had. And then Jesus shows up. Anybody grab third message this morning? And a certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women said. <laughs> like they doubted, right? Like every time my wife says something, I have to go look for myself type of. And they found it just as the women had said, but he they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and uh, to enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scripture and, these concern, and things concerning himself. Then, I love this big old then right here. Then they drew near to the village where they were going and he indicated that he would have gone farther. And they constrained Jesus saying, abide with us for it is toward the evening and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Verse 30. Now it, when it, now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them and he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight hmm maybe you and I have had those moments when Jesus shows up peace fills the room and all of a sudden he's vanished from us now we have to walk by faith and no longer by sight 
Now we have to, whatever that looks like to us, begin to walk and stand on the word of God that we've seen, that we've heard, that we've realized that's been revealed to us. And they said to one another, and I love this, I love this right here because it seems like we miss this in America. In in our Americanized religion, we miss this. But in our Christian walk with God, we should never miss this. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Imagine you and I in our brokenness and Jesus rolls in and unrolls the scrolls. And by the way, it wasn't King James. It wasn't New King James. It wasn't NIV. It wasn't American Standard Version. It wasn't all these things. But he unrolled the scrolls, right? There was no arguing what he was reading. There was no arguing what he was sharing when he began to share the scriptures. And so we find ourselves something burning inside of us because the scrolls had been opened up, because the scripture had been opened up to us. So they rose up from in that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found eleven of and and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now last week we had communion. I was amazed how many people thanked us for that. I was amazing how many people were grateful for that. That they said that that was perfect, right, for the day that we were celebrating. Why wouldn't we want to remember him in such a way, the only way, by the way, that he said, do this in remembrance of me. And so we catch ourselves in that, or at least I hope you caught yourself in that. We find ourselves that he was revealed to us in the breaking of the bread. The reality came, or at least a revelation possibly came, that when you took that bread and we said, as Jesus said, this is my body which was broken for you. It became not only personal, it became real. It should have become a revelation. There should have been something happened that he began to reveal himself to you in the breaking of the bread. I started to do communion again this morning, if I'm honest with you. I thought, you know what, if we do it again this morning, nobody will think anything about it. They'll actually maybe grab hold of it, and since I didn't plan that and have all that ready, here we are, we're having to look back over our shoulder again and just declare that he was there in the breaking of the bread. And when I think about that, how many times have we come into the house of God and needed something and wanted something, or maybe even looking for something, and possibly that it was communion day. Did we open our minds and open our hearts that he could reveal himself to us in the breaking of the bread? And so we move on from that. These two disciples walking seven miles to Emmaus and carrying with them, of course, right? After finding the tomb is empty, carrying with them their worries, their concern, even their fears. And possibly you showed up at the house. You didn't walk here this morning, but it's possible you drove seven miles or you drove 15 miles or 19 miles. You drove 40 miles. You drove 60 miles to get to the house of the Lord, and with you, you brought your worries and your concern, your sadness, your grief, whatever else was going on this week, you brought it right down the road, maybe not the road to Emmaus, but the road to the house of God, and this is where we find ourselves, that just in life, we have a lot to process, and just in life, these disciples had a lot to process, because in this moment, they're questioning if Jesus has abandoned them, and I'm wondering how many of us... I've asked that question just this week, maybe last month, maybe when you lost a loved one, maybe when the marriage fell apart, maybe when the diagnosis came, maybe when, or maybe when, that we find ourselves with the same problems that they're dealing with, the same questions that may, they may even have, but I find in verse number 18, the question that they ask him when he asks a question, why, why are you talking or what are you talking about when you're walking and you're very sad? And then they ask him a question straight back. Don't you love when someone answers a question with a question? And so then he says, right? What does he, does he begin to say? Let's read 18. So he began to say something else in verse number 18. And <clears throat> or they began to say something in verse number 18 after he had already asked them what they were talking about. And He's, uh, they said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem that don't know what's going on? I'm going to break that down for you. I'm going to say that it was one of those things where they said, where in the world have you been that you don't know what's going on in Jerusalem? Are you some stranger in this town? And I, I love that because here's the thing. He is, he's in fact... Even in today, in 2024, right here on this day, right in April, he's still the only one that really knows exactly what's going on. 
Because possibly you watched the news this week, and I won't talk much about that. You watched the news this week, you saw the TikToks this week, you saw all the stuff this week, and maybe you're saying, Jesus, where were you? Where are you? Oh, don't you see what's going on? And he does see clearly what's going on. And by the way, I hope you got your eclipse glasses for this week, just throwing that out there, because he knows about that also. And so we go ahead, and I, I think that uh, when they begin to ask him, right, when they begin to ask him, who are you, that was a shot for sure, right? In their brokenness, they said something that was meant to be hurtful with Jesus. He don't care about that. Jesus began to share with them, began to, more than anything, as they walked, he listened. And I think about that, and you don't know, right? You don't know, and so where in the world have you been? And I'm wondering if he looked back over his shoulder and possibly as he began to share with them that maybe it doesn't say this, okay? doesn't say this. Uh, it's possible that if he were to answer a little bit differently, he would have said he was there. It's possible that he would have began to talk, and his scripture even says that he began to talk about Moses, and he carried on with Moses and talked about, I feel certain that he talked about the children of Israel having nothing to eat but manna from heaven, right? He was there. And even when they were thirsty in a, in a foreign land, what happened then, right? Water came out of, he was there. When they began to cross the Jordan, he was there. When the walls fell, he was there. And can I tell you, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was tossed into the fiery furnace, he was there. And I want to make sure you know he was there because in Daniel chapter 3, verse 24 and 25, astonished King Nebuchadnezzar stood in terror and asked his advisors, didn't we throw three men in the fire bound firmly with ropes? In reply to them, they said, yes, your majesty. He told them, look. I see four men walking untied and unharmed in the middle of the fire, and the appearance of the fourth man resembles a divine being. Or one, one translation says, is likened to the living Son of God. So when we talk about the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, can I help you with something? He was, he was there. And so maybe we could chase the gauntlet. Maybe you would want to run through all the scriptures that we could share that about, and I'm not going to, but you could, right? All throughout Scripture, he was there. Jesus was there. He was equipping and empowering. He was there. When David faced Goliath, he was there. Why? Because he's the one that was, that is, and is to come. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if we'll allow him into our lives, into our conversation, into our brokenness, we can look over our shoulder and say, he was there in my brokenness in my fear he was equipping me he was empowering me he was sending me out to face the battle the battle I didn't necessarily want to fight and knew I couldn't fight it alone but here I am fighting it because he was there and so maybe, maybe this morning that you can maybe run through the gauntlet of all the times the wreck that you survived and shouldn't have he was there the diagnosis that they declared stage four, but you're still here. He was there. When the kids were headed the wrong direction and you're hearing all the things and all the stuff, right? And you're about to lose your, yeah, guess what? He was there. And so when we look back over our shoulder, and I think it's okay to do that. Please don't get stuck back there. But when we look over our shoulder, we look over our shoulder for a testimony. We look over our shoulder for a witness. We look over our shoulder to declare that when I wasn't all in, he was still there. When I was living crazy and I made it through the night. When I was living wild and I made it all the way home that night. When I was doing things I shouldn't be doing with people I shouldn't have been doing it with. Then he was there. That's why I'm here. And so we can declare just like these two disciples as they were breaking bread and whether you ever break bread in the physical or not I pray that you'll break bread in the spiritual you see what I like about this story I guess maybe I don't know what I love about the story is in those moments as they were carrying their concerns and their worries and their fears he was there and he didn't run off right to fix something else or somebody else he was there and now on this side of Calvary, he can be in Fort Chiswell and Withfield and Glade Springs and he can be in Sparta and in Bland and he can be in Christiansburg and he can be there. And so when I look at that and I'm thinking that maybe possibly sometimes in our quiet moments, maybe we would want him to reveal himself to us as he revealed himself to the two disciples. But 
Here's the beauty of the two disciples when Jesus revealed himself to them. They didn't tuck away and sleep it off. You see, they had already told him, come stay with us. The, the evening is far spent and it's nighttime. Come stay with us. And in other words, you, we'll journey again tomorrow. But when they, once they realized that Jesus was who he was, then they begin to book it again. You see, there's something about having a revelation of who Jesus is. That it feels like the day is about done. I'm just about finished. I'm just going to turn in and call it a day. But when Jesus reveals himself, there's some energy rises up, some enthusiasm rises up. Up, some excitement and expectation rises up and the disciples take off and said I've got to find my day is well spent I'm wore out I'm about done with this I'm ready to call it quits but Jesus showed up you see there's times in our lives we're just about done with it there's times in our lives when we're ready to throw in the tower give up and when Jesus reveals himself there's something about that it rejuvenizes us rejuvenizes me anyway and we find ourselves in that moment and we can declare that in the diagnosis, he was there. At the three o'clock phone call that I never wanted to get, he was there. At the one o'clock knock on the door that I never wanted to get, he was there. At the phone call when my mom or my person was crying on the other end, sharing news I never wanted to hear, he was there. And so I'm wondering if you've ever been on the road to Emmaus walking through life with concerns and worries, walking through life with fears, walking through life with life, right? I'm wondering if in those moments, if you were so busy being worried and so busy being concerned and so busy being fearful, that you didn't stop to hear him. You didn't see him when he showed up in our moments of grief, in our moments of brokenness, in our moments of loneliness, in our moments of not even misunderstanding, but not being able to understand. Did we allow him in? Were we willing to pause and say, I'm wore out and I'm done? And listen, I want to hear more. He's unrolled the scrolls. And I, I love that they said that the, the uh, fire began to burn in them, right? That something jumped in their spirit as he was reading the scriptures, right? Because you know what happens when the teacher of all teachers begins to speak. The preacher of all preachers begins to preach. I can imagine the fire that rose up inside of them as Jesus began to share his very own story of time and time again. He has been there. Did you not remember? Do you not know? Have you forgotten that I was there in that moment and there in that moment? And though you quit on me, I was there in that moment. And though you quit coming to the house of God, I was there. And though you gave up on me, I was there. I promised that I would never leave you nor forsake you. And I promise in my word that nothing can separate you from the love of God. You can be the center of all sinners, but the love of God is still available if you'll turn around and receive it. He was there. And so this morning, I'll ask you, have you opened yourself in such a way to him that you see it was in that intimate moment you don't break bread with just somebody you don't care about right I, I wouldn't go out to eat with just everybody I don't want to sound mean right but you have an intimate circle that you go eat with right I've never had a stranger just call up and say hey man uh, this is so and so and I, I was just passing through town and hey I just want to take y'all to eat never had that happen right now, if he mentions that he has a check, an envelope with a check in it, then I probably will, I'll, I'll order the steak. I felt led of the Lord to come to Fort Chisel and give you a check. I said, I'll see you at the exit in five minutes. But as a rule, we break bread with those closest to us, don't we, for the most part. And in those intimate moments, or at least that's the way I feel, when we, take, when we broke bread with Jesus last week, it was an intimate moment. It was a quiet time. It was a time of building our relationship and allowing him to build our relationship with him. And so when I think about that, that it's possible we've busied our life up so much that we don't take any intimate time anymore. That we don't stop for a moment and say, reveal yourself to me. In my brokenness, reveal yourself. In my need, reveal yourself. In my victories, reveal yourself. In my dreams and my hopes and my aspirations, reveal yourself I need you more than I need anything else and it's in those moments that we allow and we stop long enough pause long enough for him to reveal himself to us right it's when we get that boost it, it just is 
you don't believe me, the, these two disciples, man, they're, they're don't, they really don't even know what they're doing. <laughs> I'll be honest. I don't, I don't know that they know what they're doing except they're going to Emmaus. We're getting away from the chaos. We're getting away from the crowd. It's just too much for me. I need to, we need to isolate ourselves. We need to get away. And in those moments, listen, isolation is the worst thing you can do. That's for free. Anybody that needs that. The, when we begin to isolate ourselves, the only relationship we generally end up with is the one of listening to our enemy fill our minds with stuff. Then we become paranoid and we hear things that's never been said. We assume things that's never happened. And, and so I'll challenge, I don't know who, that's free, but we're going to move on. They were willing to step away and isolate themselves, and Jesus showed up and gave them a word. Jesus showed up and unrolled the scrolls. Jesus showed up, and their life changed, and it would never be the same. You can go on and read about that. It would never be the same again. Revelation came with relationship. I need a relationship with the Father. I need a relationship with Christ. I need a relationship that I am in that moment of breaking bread with him, and while I'm breaking bread with him, communing with him, praying or just listening, that revelation comes. He reveals himself. And if nobody else in this building needs that, I need that. If no one else has, had, a, had a day last week or last month that they needed that, I needed that. And I can tell you from experience from my walk, he was there when I needed that. He was there when I was broken. He was there when I was sick. He was there when I was diagnosed. Most of you know that some 20, man, maybe 22 years ago now that I wasn't, I wasn't supposed to live six months, but guess, he was there. He's still here, right? But he, he's, I realize he's there because I take a moment to look for him. I've been saved 34 years, over 34 years, and here's the beauty of it. It's not all been perfect, right? If you're wondering if Christ said you're not good enough and I'm not doing everything right, you see, Christ isn't looking for perfection. Two things he is looking for, I believe, is submission, that we just give it to him anyway, right? I, it's all ugly, but I'm going to give it to God. I, my life's a mess. I'm just going to give it to God. I'm not going to try to clean up first. I'm not going to try to... The, I've never caught a fish that was already clean. You? To be kind of gross, I'd throw it back. I'll be honest. But all the fish that we've ever caught in the physical fish, we've had to clean after, right? And so it's possible that whatever you're carrying today that Jesus has already showed up and he's asking you this morning if you'll allow him to show up. Will you pause for just a moment? Will you stop for just a minute? Would you be willing to believe for it? that I can meet you right in your knee. If you're lost this morning, undone without Christ, only you know that. I don't know that. But it's possible, right, that there's someone in here that doesn't have a relationship with Christ and you're not here by happenstance, accident, right? It's not a coincidence. But you're here because you've been broken. You're here because you came looking. You're here because God had you here this morning. And it's possible that if you would give him your quiet time, your moment, that he'll reveal himself to you. You see, Scripture says that if you want to be saved, it's pretty simple, really. Believe on the Lord, right? He says, believe in your heart that he was raised on the third day. But right before that, he says, confess with your mouth. That's it. It's that easy. Pastor Tammy had an 84-year-old uncle, never been saved. 84 years, 84 years. I'm going to tell you, don't chance that. Don't chance that and say, he'll give me 84 years like he did Pastor Tammy's uncle. Yeah, I don't know about that. But I do know that at 84 years old and with his feeble little body, that he asked my bride, he said, would you, I want to talk to you before y'all leave. And they went into his room and he was crippled in his knees and she just shared with him the gospel. Told him how much Jesus loves him in spite of him. And in that moment, this 84-year-old gentleman began to climb down off of his bed. And she said, listen, you don't have to get down on your knees. I know how. He said, nope. I want to do this right. And at 84 years old, he cried out to Jesus in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, Jesus does show up in Columbus. In case you're wondering. And he gave his heart to the Lord. 84 years. 
I don't know how old you are today, but I would encourage you not to wait or chance 84 years. If you need Christ as your Savior today, this is the day. If you need to meet him or have him meet you right in the middle of your mess, this is the day. If you need to surrender yourself and just pause for a moment, this altar is open and you can find yourself a place to kneel and you don't have to do that, of course, but you can meet him right where you're at. If that's you this morning, today's the day. That maybe you could say, y'all probably don't know nothing about this at work tomorrow, but I took a walk on the road to Emmaus yesterday. Jesus met me there in my worry, in my concern, in my guilt, in my shame, and in my sin. And he revealed himself to me when I got quiet before him. And I asked him to forgive me. He forgave me. My name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. All of heaven began to rejoice. He was there. Would you stand with me this morning? God, we love you today. We give you glory in this house and how beautiful you are, how wonderful you are, how merciful you are, how gracious you are. And God, as we look back over our shoulder, there's not a person here, Lord, that can not look over their shoulder somewhere, even in their crazy days, even in their uh, lost moments, even in their worst moments, that they can't look over their shoulder and say, he was there or I'd have never made it. He was there or I wouldn't have pulled through. He was there or I wouldn't have survived it. He was there. He was there. And so God, this morning, would you just begin to love on this congregation and whatever level and wherever anyone's at this morning with you, would you just begin to love on them? Lord, that we'll declare this, this day, Lord, those of us that know you as our Savior, we would declare this day that we're going to seek more intimate time with you. We're going to break more bread with you. God, we want you to reveal yourself to us, Lord, every day. Reveal yourself. And for those, Lord, that may be here and don't have a relationship with you, would you just love on them? Would you just love them into the kingdom of heaven and let them know that you love them in spite of them, in spite of our mistakes, our errors, our shortcomings? Lord, and it's okay, I'll tell them for you. I know you're waiting to take their shame and guilt and regret away. I know you're waiting with open arms. As the father of the prodigal son, when the son came home, he ran and kissed his son on the neck, welcomed him home. God, you're here this morning with open arms. With your head still bowed and eyes closed, and absolutely this altar is open, but maybe you just want to be real with me and with God this morning, and you just say, Pastor, I want to give my heart to the Lord today. If that's you, just slip your hand up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to start over today. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You see, that's why you're here. Amen. That's why you're here. And you just whisper a prayer if that's all right, or you can shout it if you want, but it seems like in this setting a whisper would be plenty, right? That you just whisper and just say, Father, thank you for loving me. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Make me new. And maybe for today, I want to add something to that and just say, make me who you created me to be for your glory. And listen, we're going to ask it right now in Jesus' name. Just say, in Jesus' name, I receive you as my Lord and risen Savior. Amen. God, we love you today. We praise you for every person, Lord, that gave their heart to you this morning, every person that raised their hand, and in doing so, they opened their heart to receive you as their Savior. Lord, we celebrate with all of heaven, and we can declare today that this congregation, those in this congregation that called on your name, stopped heaven, stopped heaven this morning as you rejoiced, as all of heaven rejoiced, that their name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. God, we give you praise. We ask for courage and strength. Lord, we ask you to use us. We ask you, God, to convict our hearts, guide us, and lead us from this day forward. And everybody can say amen this morning. Would you give God a hand clap of praise? I'm believing. If you gave your heart to the Lord, listen, the very next step in your walk with God is to be baptized. I want to challenge you to be baptized. It's just a moment when you say, you know what? God already done something in me. I want everybody to see what he's done in me. He's going to do it outwardly. You're going to show it outwardly. 
by being baptized. And if that's you today and you feel like, man, I have on the wrong clothes, can I just challenge you with one statement? It's just water. The same kind of water you're going to toss them in in your laundry room. We just don't have any tide or gain back here. But it's just water. Listen, we love you guys and ladies. Thank you all for being a part of this ministry. We'd love to see you Wednesday night. We'd love to see you back at 1230 for baptizing. But we look forward to hearing great testimony, great witness, how God changed your life, directed you different today. Amen? God bless you guys. You have a great day.